Welcome to week one of Strategic Planning, LDR 660 for Sienna Heights University. I'm John Wallace. We're going to go through a broad overview here. Some of the material will be from Bryson, and some will be additional parts that I've brought in. Strategic planning in many cases is an unfortunate reality. We look at Dilbert here. Copyright, of course, to Dilbert. I'm putting you on the strategic planning team. It's like work, but without the satisfaction of accomplishing anything. You're new, so let me explain how this works. We have meetings and talk about the company's strategy in vague emotional terms. In time, we convince ourselves that we're more than mediocre thinkers who sit around complaining. We start believing our opinions will steer the company. We feel important. We feel alive. Then we snap out of it and make view graphs that say we should keep doing what we're doing. I like making view graphs. Actually, we just use last year's view graphs. I know some folks who not too long ago worked for a Fortune 500 company that actually went through that. At the end of every year when they started to do strategic planning for the next year, they essentially just changed the dates on the previous year's documents. Our class objectives are to increase your ability as an individual and in groups, because nobody really works on their own, to apply strategic thinking. That's thinking in context about how to pursue purposes or achieve goals. This also includes thinking about what the context is and how it might or should be changed and what the purposes are and should be and what capabilities or competencies will or might be needed to complete them. How will they be used to achieve the purposes? Strategic acting is acting in context in light of future consequences to achieve strategic purposes or to facilitate learning. We don't set an organizational goal and then just say, okay, go do that. There has to be steps along the way. Strategic learning is any change in a system, which could be in an individual as well, that by adapting is better to its environment to produce a more or less permanent change in its capacity to produce its purposes. I know that sounds kind of academic, but organizational learning is highly important in today's complex world. Strategic planning and strategic management are not the same thing, and there is no one-size-fits-all model that fits all organizations and circumstances. That's one of the reasons you have an assignment this week to go out and search for other models. Strategic planning and strategic management are more than just a matter of your preferences, but what fits the organizational culture, mission, vision, and values. So many times, change in organizations doesn't work because we've tried to do something out of the context of the organizational culture or that's against the mission, vision, and values of the organization. And there are hundreds of models, whether you want to talk about Harvard, uh, stakeholder management method, strategic issues method, Hoshin Conry, balance scorecard. So although we're using Bryson in our text, there are numerous strategic planning models in one of your assignments this week. Aside from the readings is to go online, research strategic planning, and find a model that appeals to you. Tell us why you picked it and upload that image and a hyperlink so we can see what you found. We're going to be using Bryson as an outline for our group projects, but that doesn't mean there isn't a model that fits your group project better and the team can decide to use whatever fits the organization. Strategic management is strategic planning with implementation. These are direct from Dr. Bryson, an article in Public Administration Review. The appropriate and reasonable integration of strategic planning and implementation across an organization or other entity in an ongoing way to enhance the fulfillment of mission, meeting of mandates, and sustained creation of public value. Strategic planning is a deliberate, disciplined effort to produce fundamental decisions and actions that shape and guide what an organization is, what it does, and why it does it. And there has to be action steps that are measured along the way. Implementation is the ongoing effort to realize in practice and organization mission, goals, and strategies, the meeting of its mandates, continued organizational learning, and the ongoing creation of public value. And again, an unfortunate reality we run into in our organizations on a regular basis as the manager comes up to you and says, you're in charge of this project. What's my budget? I'll need to approve all expenses. Who will report to me? Your team will report to me and I'll tell them what to do. I'll start on the project plan. Um, well, skip that. I already have a plan in my head. Hypothetically, who would be to blame if this project failed? Well, you're in charge. <laughs> Dilbert is amazingly accurate. 
There are process design functions within strategic planning, and particularly within the model that Bryson is going to show us. Notice that the arrows here cross back and forth, because although Bryson's model shows us 10 steps, they don't necessarily happen in the order of 1 through 10. 10 definitely comes at the end, but our entire purpose is to create value. We're looking at the mission of the organization and fulfilling that with goals and objectives that can be measured. We make decisions and actions that guide who we are, what we do, and why we do it. And we need effective participation across the organization with multiple stakeholders, including the mission, the goals, the strategies. We build coalitions. We determine what the strategic issues are for the organization and how we're going to implement solutions. And we build capacity within the organization for learning and implementation because, again, change happens so rapidly today. We need to be prepared for multiple options. This is Bryson's model. Simple, straightforward, 10 steps. And you're going to see it quite often, and you should get to know it familiarly. Again, that doesn't mean that they happen in the order of 1 through 10, other than we don't actually implement strategy that we haven't created yet. The God's honest truth is that strategic planning and management are not soft sciences. They are hard arts. This is a skill. Expertise is something that is built slowly and requires engagement with both theory and practice. We're going to push the boundaries in order to find out what the limits are. Engaging intentionally with the experiential learning cycle is one of the best ways of building expertise. A key learning has to do with knowing how best to design strategic planning and management processes, including knowing which tools approaches, and techniques to use. And remember, there are many models. So although we're using Bryson for this class, there may be something else that's more appropriate when you're back out in the workforce. I've actually heard these phrases in the past year from different organizational leaders that we've worked with. We had a strategic plan in 2004, and it sat on the shelf ever since. Nobody's looked at it. We have a strategic plan, but nobody follows it. I saw it once, but it's about 60 pages long, and who's got time to go through that? There's too much work to do. Again, an unfortunate reality. I'll give you a chance to read this one on your own. Cotter and Cohen, from their book in 2002 about organizational change, discuss urgency relating to reducing the fear, complacency, and anger that change creates because change is not only inevitable, it's constant. And remember, if we're doing a strategic plan, we're talking about organizational change to make ourselves more relevant and create more value than we currently are. As Collins, good to great, would say, get the right people on the bus. If we don't have champions who can both communicate and demonstrate the vision, we won't reach our objectives. If the vision is not clear or means different things to different departments or different hierarchies, it can't be clearly communicated, believed in, and achieved. As part of the strategy, there must be a communication plan in place to reach all stakeholders and in multiple forms. That's Howard Gardner. Barriers and obstacles will exist, even within organizational processes and culture, and intrinsically within each of us, as well as externally. If there's no resources available, for example, or we're not adaptable enough when the market changes, change is blocked, and we have to be prepared for the obstacles that are going to come. While long-term goals, broad goals, exist, there must be a series of incremental wins, action plans that can be measured, achieved, and celebrated to build momentum. Establish critical success factors along the way. Millennials and Generation Xers in particular aren't waiting years to find a payoff. They'll leave and go work for somebody else. If we're prepared for resistance, which is again natural, and have sufficient rewards and reinforcement plans, then persistence will overcome whatever obstacles come. Psychology tells us it takes at least 30 days to form a new habit. Given the variation which comes depending on the size and structure of an organization, making sure that the change flows across the organization to all departments and all levels is crucial. Howard Gardner, in his 2006 book, Changing Minds, gives us seven R's that are key to affecting changing minds, whether it's our own individually or it's the organization. Number one, there must be a reason. Members must understand that there is a need for change. There must be research providing important information that supports the reason. It must resonate across. The understanding of change must reach to the core beliefs of all members and participants. 
Read descriptions. The basis for change must be expressed in multiple forms. Numbers, graphics, pictures, posters. Shine suggests that the stories which bind members together are the most important. Edgar Shine, 2004. Resources and rewards. Members must have the tools they need to complete the change and a reward for success beyond simply keeping your job. Real world events. Change will not be successful if it doesn't relate to real life and what's occurring outside of the organization. And resistances. Every human comes from their own personal paradigms and resistances to change is inevitable but can be overcome. You must remain vigilant and persistent. Fernandez and Rainey in 2006 and their discussion about change talk about ensuring the need, providing a plan, build internal support and overcoming resistance, top management commitment. Look, if organizational leaders are not going to live up to the vision, values, and mission and not change at all, why should we expect that those below them in a department or across the organization will change? They won't. There must be external supports. We have to have the resources. It must be institutionalized, the change across the organization, and we must pursue comprehensive change. This Fernandez and Rainey article is one of the articles you can choose to read for week two in the doc sharing folder. A great example of a nonprofit who is very transparent and very open in their work and what they do and how they do it, how, what, where, when, why, is Save the Children. And there's a link here if you had downloaded the PDF, but you can also just search Save the Children and take a look at their website. What does it tell you about the organization? In week one, you were going to do a case study on PennDOT. That's the Pennsylvania Department of Transportation. Their plan is available both in the doc sharing folder and also in the week one section on the left column. So you need to read through that discussion and then... You don't need to do all of these. Just share your thoughts, a couple of paragraphs on who the key stakeholders are. The SWAT, or SWAC, with a C instead of a T, as Bryson will discuss it. Strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. You should be very familiar with how to do those. What are the key issues they faced in trying to change the organization and suggested strategies? Just have a conversation and then, of course, comment on a couple of other posts. So if the first person does a SWOT analysis on PennDOT, then the next poster would not want to do that. You'd want to go some other direction. I can tell you, though, that the results of the implementation of that strategic plan you're going to read, potholes throughout the state, corruption, bad image, corrupt finances, a horrible organization, terrible resources, human resources management, and Governor Thornburg's and Tom Larson's careers came to an end because of the failure of, in particular, that plan and what happened in the state of Pennsylvania. Rome is an economic and business administration professor at Tilburg University in the Netherlands and is cited by Bryson in your text. The fact of the matter is that paying attention to how our organizations are designed, where people sit, how the structure is, how the processes flow, is a huge impact on the ability to reach goals, strategies, and objectives. This article is from Organization Science. It's also available for review in your week two assignments. And in his article, Rome talks about purpose. We produce systems that don't yet exist. We're going to change the present system to what we want it to be. We have to have a view of knowledge, pragmatic, emphasizing participation, discourse, and experimentation to find the right alignment. And theory development. Does an integrated set of design propositions work in a certain ill-defined problem situation? You have a combination of people knowledge and technology combining together within an organization to produce a desired result. Roger Martin is the dean of the Rotman School of Management in Toronto, and one of his books is called The Design of Business. And this fits also within your toolbox. Your current paradigm, your stance is that your world is reliably oriented and your world rewards existing stage refinement. It rewards improvement. That guides the tools that you use. So nonetheless, you seek to balance reliability with validity, and you seek to advance the stage of knowledge. Those tools that you use help guide your experience, and then it flows back up again. The experience is to deepen the mystery and nurture originality, creative innovation. As you grow an experience, you gain new tools, which changes your worldview. Again, one of the reasons why you're in graduate school to begin with. Martin's knowledge funnel certainly applies in a strategic planning and management process. The future is uncertain, and it is delving into the mysteries of life, of service, of creating value within our lives and thus our organizations that we derive purpose. As we grow, and in particular within our teams and relationships, we create an organizational learning culture. 
We developed more experience-based capabilities for problem-solving, discovery, and visioning. That's the heuristic. As we refine the knowledge through practice, failure, and success, remember we don't often learn from success, we definitely should learn from failures, we're able to turn our competencies into an algorithm. Of course, a replicatable process within us that is better able to respond more rapidly to change and opportunity or to solve crises without falling into the abyss of dysfunction. Of course, in pure mathematics, algorithms can be done by machines. But while there is certainly number crunching within any strategic plan, it is much more about quantitative person-to-person -person data. And machines simply can't replace face-to-face -face time. Healthy debate is a form of conflict evident at all times in organizations. According to Heifetz, 1994, his work in Leadership Without Easy Answers, concluded that adaptive conflict, the ability of followers to have input, be heard, and acknowledged by management, is at the core of successful transformational leadership and thus organizational change. Within the potential readings for next week's assignment are a few key articles in this regard, including one that talks about the specific KSAs one needs to facilitate in strategic planning. Make no mistake, a thorough strategic process and strategic management as a whole is fraught with potential conflict as individuals and departments fight over resources and objectives. You have to have seen it before in your organizations. Constructive conflict, deliberative argumentation, as Bryson would say, requires careful observation, especially if you're the facilitator. Rich rather than superficial descriptions, and all of your professors at Siena Heights are always in your discussion threads asking you to get below the surface of things. Normative reasoning about what constitutes a good outcome consideration of various strategies for accomplishing the outcomes, and evaluation that reflects different attitudes, beliefs, and values. Not everyone sitting at the table is going to agree 100% of the time. Campion and Stevens article from the Journal of Management is where this chart comes from, and again, it's one of the articles you can choose from next week to read. Conflict resolution needs to be encouraging desirable but discouraging undesirable team conflict. We have to have the hard discussions. Otherwise, we won't get past the issues. We need to recognize the type and source of conflict and implement an appropriate conflict solution and use win-win negotiation strategies rather than the traditional distributive win-lose strategy. It needs to be collaborative, use participative group problem-solving techniques, and recognize obstacles and implement the appropriate, again, corrective actions. And in communication, we need to understand communication networks throughout the organization and the decentralized networks as well. We need to be transparent. Messages should be behavior or event-oriented, congruent, validating, conjunctive, and owned. We need to use active listening techniques. We need to understand verbal as well as nonverbal skills and realize the importance of small talk and engagement. If you're not aware of the research that says the small talk that members do around the coffee pot or the water cooler, as it may be, is highly important to developing a relationship where you can get through those difficult times, it is. So small talk, even if we're not good at it, is important, and we need to let that occur. Bryson's model here again, and you can see his 10 steps based on years of scientific research. Can you see areas where breakdowns may occur? Conflict and resistance are simply natural so that the facilitator and leaders need to be prepared for it? You should be able to. When we're facilitating strategic planning, when we're leading the organization in strategic planning, we have to be able to sit back and see the broad picture and then pull the best out of everyone who's involved. I think this is long enough at this point, so we'll take a break and uh, you can come back and watch video number two when you're ready.